Good morning and welcome all this morning to worship on this Good Shepherd Sunday. And a very good morning for the Woolies as well, so thank you to the sheep. On behalf of the congregation, I welcome all visitors and invite you to join us for morning tea following the service. Thank you. Today is the fourth Sunday in the Easter season. It is known in the Christian calendar as Good Shepherd Sunday. We will be observing this theme in our worship this morning. We will be reminded of the special relationship we enjoy with the Lord, who is our Good Shepherd. Let us worship God. Lord Jesus, we come to worship you today as the Good Shepherd. As we meet together in fellowship, we rejoice that we are part of a great flock, a flock of people that are, belong to you around the world. How privileged we are to join with them, to sing our praise to you, and acknowledge that you are the King of love, whose goodness never fails. Be pleased to accept the worship we bring, for your name's sake. Amen.
for Jesus, our loving shepherd, we confess that we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. Your life stands waiting, inviting us into the place of kindness and reassurance. But there are times when we refuse to enter and be forgiven and healed. We feel that we have to justify ourselves and make compensation for our frailties rather than being open to your grace. Sometimes we see your sheepfold of care as belonging to us rather than belonging to you. We fail to invite others into the gentleness of your fold, making our own judgments in relation to who deserves your welcome. Graciously pardon and forgive us. Lord Jesus, our loving shepherd, take our hands and draw us to yourself. We pray that you will help us to believe in the depths and lengths of your loving life for your dear name's sake. Amen. Even when we stray like lost sheep, the Good Shepherd finds us and brings us back into the fold. Through Christ we are found and forgiven. Boys and girls, please make your way up to the front for your talk. <clears throat> Welcome. Good. Well, I've got a, an object with me this morning, and uh, I want you to tell me what it is. It's a quite a big kind of object, so let, let's have a look at it. What is this? A ladder. No, it's not a ladder. Well, could, could you use it as a ladder? I suppose you could, but I'm not sure it would, uh, wouldn't, well, apart from anything else, it wouldn't get you up very high, and it might, depending on how what weight you are, it might not support you very well. No, it's not, a, it's not a ladder. You should all know what this is. I'm sure you've seen them in your house. What is it? A what? I need help. What is it? It's part of a what? Part of a baby crib. Mm, no. Ah, uh, well, well, I'll seek the expert's advice. So you're a, an experienced hand of this kind of thing. What is this? It's a gate, that's right. Or as you Aussie say, gate. Well, I say it with my... Is that the way you say it? So tell us how it actually works, and then we'll see if we can... I, I used to have these in my house many years ago, but I haven't... What's that? I have, a, I have a gate in my house in my yard. Oh, you're good. Yeah. Very good. So how does this actually work? So it's, it's too long to save you. A small gate. Yes. But if the, if the opening is wider, you can make it wider. Is there any way that we could um, put it here? Is, that, is it too narrow? That probably is a well, bit. We can't do it before the sermon. No. <laughs> Let's see if we could possibly... 
Not really, but, but put it there anyway. I mean, that, that's okay. Just leave it there. That's fine. All right. Thanks very much. So, now, who wants to preach the sermon today? Sophia. Right, you try and get into the pulpit, but don't touch the gate. Come, on, tr- come ahead. Try and climb up into the pulpit. That's not what I wanted you to do. Oh, oh you're right. You're right. Where are the ex- health and safety people here? They'll have a, they'll have a field day. If you want to go up into the pulpit, Sophia, and I know I've told you before that you can go to the pulpit because you've got so many wonderful things to say to us all. How are you going to get up there? What do you need to do to get up into the pulpit? You're clearly blocked at the moment, so what do you have to do? Did you say climb over this gate? All right, well, what do you reckon? Anybody else? uh, If you're going to get through here, up into the pulpit, what do you have to go through? The the what? The gate. The what? That's it. Right, now, Sufi. Oh, it's not working the way we should because it's probably not designed... It's a little bit too narrow for what we actually want to do. We could use one of the other doors, but then the, your mums and dads and all the older people wouldn't be able to see what we're doing. So I'll tell you what we'll do. Right, Sophie, stand up. You stand up. Oh. Climb up on, into the... Oh. <laughs> all right, you might as well all go. Go on. You can say hello to us when you're up there. All right. Now, come back down again. Come back down. Come on ahead. Why can't you get through? Because the gate is closed. Right. Oh, look. There's no theology to describe this. I'm sorry. Every time these kids make a mess of my kids' talks. Thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you. Now, quieten down all the ways. Nobody can hear what I'm trying to say. You see, when... Now, you sit over there. Sit over there. The only way that you could get up into the pulpit, when I had the gate right here, was if I opened the gate and allowed you to go through. Now, one or two of you tried to go up some other way. In fact, Jesus, interestingly, had something to say about people like that. But maybe we'll talk about that another day. The point is, yes, what are you going to say? That's right. That's correct, the robbers. And we read about that in John chapter 10. Because in that passage, in John chapter 10... I read that. Not now. We'll do it later on after church. How about that? And then we can maybe do it in a proper door. You see, Jesus once said, I am the gate. And what he was saying was, if you want to enter into my sheepfold... The only way you can enter is through me. That's what we're going to be thinking about in our service later today. So I want you to remember those important words of Jesus when he said, I am the gate. Sometimes Jesus uh, talks about the door. Some Bible translations actually have the word door in place of gate. But the point is, the lesson we must learn today is, that the way into the sheepfold of Jesus is through the door or the gate. But the amazing thing is, Jesus is that gate. And we'll talk about that later after you've gone to Sunday school. So remember our lesson for today, the words of Jesus, I am the gate.
if you walk through me into the sheepfold, then you will be safe. You will belong to me. You will be part of my flock. So remember, Jesus said, I am the... Don't forget that important lesson. Thank you. This is the 23rd Psalm in the New Living Translation. The Lord is he's my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me by peaceful streams. He renews my strength and he guides me in right ways bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk in the dark valley of death, I won't be afraid, for sure you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil, my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and your never-ending love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever.
The New Testament lesson this morning is from John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, going through to verse 10. This may be found in the order of service. Hear the word of God. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> The announcements can be found in the bulletin, but I would like to say that the Day PWA will be meeting this Thursday at 12 noon for a 1 p.m. start in the hall. Uh, this, this evening at the church at five, Fern Johnson and Jordan Warner will be presenting a, a music for the uh, program they have been before and they are wonderful to come and hear. So if you are free and would like to come for a treat, then please come and hear Fern and Jordan. Last Sunday evening we had over a hundred people here listening to the former Bishop of Baghdad and it was certainly a wonderful evening of fellowship and to hear the impact of his work in Baghdad was amazing. Thank you.
Well, as you can see from the caption on the front of the order of service, today is known in the Christian calendar as Good Shepherd Sunday. It will be marked by many cathedrals and churches all over the world today. Worship services will include hymns, Bible readings, prayers, and sermons that will focus on the theme of the shepherd and his sheep. Good Shepherd Sunday is the Sunday when modern preachers, many of whom have rarely, if ever, seen a sheep, try their best to interpret this image to their own flocks, which congregations are sometimes called. What we find is that it's been done so often, it's hard to say something original about it. The image of God as shepherd and people as sheep is found throughout the Hebrew writings. Uh, David, the shepherd boy turned king, spoke of sheep and shepherding several times throughout the Psalms. The best example is Psalm 23 that we read earlier in the service. The prophets contain the same imagery from Isaiah 40 to Jeremiah 23 to Ezekiel 34. God is always considered to be the good shepherd. All other shepherds compared to him are found to be lacking. The imagery Jesus uses would have been familiar to his listeners in a society where sheep farming was a staple of the economy. Jesus takes the image of the good shepherd, and he proclaims that he is that person. He is the good shepherd. We discover this in John chapter 10, verse 11a and 14a, a little bit beyond our passage for this morning. But this is not what our lectionary gospel passage is all about for this particular Sunday. In our gospel text for today, Jesus declares, and we've already been mentioning this to the boys and girls, He is the gate or some translations put it, the door for the sheep. John 10, verses 7 and 9, Therefore Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Well, it's obvious that a gate or a door is very different to a shepherd. Jesus describes himself as a gate, and then shortly after he describes himself as a shepherd. Quite a difference. Jesus makes an explicit statement here about himself. Explicit statements by Jesus are not all that frequent in the mystical, obscure gospel of John but when he does make one, it usually is about his divine identity, Jesus being the Son of God. This statement here, I am the gate, is an example of this. Jesus states emphatically that he is the right way. Indeed, He is the only way into the sheepfold, into the kingdom. Now, this is not a popular message these days. People don't like that sense of exclusivism. Some people say, well, Jesus is one way, one of many ways. But Jesus here is pointing out that He is not only the right way, but the only way. 
If you want to go into the kingdom, the only way to enter it is through Jesus and Him alone. Well, there is a beautiful illustration of this on the front cover of your order of service. If you look at your front cover, you will see the sheepfold, the sheep inside, and you'll see the shepherd sitting there in that little gap, and that represents the gate. There's no actual physical gate because Jesus Himself is that gate. The sheepfold or pen was probably a large communal enclosure where several flocks were herded for safety at night. In his commentary in John's Gospel, William Barclay paints a vivid picture of the two kinds of sheepfolds in the time of Jesus. Let me read this little section to you. It's a bit long, so bear with me, but it is helpful to give us an insight into the picture or the image that Jesus is using here. In the villages and towns themselves, there were communal sheepfolds where all the village flocks were sheltered when they returned at night. These folds were protected by a strong door of which only the guardian of the door held the key. It was to that kind of fold Jesus referred to in verses 2 and 3. But when the sheep were out on the hills in the warm season and did not return at night to the village at all, they were collected into sheepfolds on the hillside. These hillside sheepfolds were just open spaces enclosed by a wall. In them, there was an opening by which the sheep came in and went out, but there was no door of any kind. What happened was that at night, the shepherd himself lay down across the opening, and no sheep could get out or in except over his body. In the most literal sense, the shepherd was the door. Now, this powerful image of a gate or door, as some translations describe it, helps to bring home to us the important point that Jesus wants to make. He is the one who lays Himself down as the gate. You see it in the picture. He is the one who lays down His very life for those who follow Him. Jesus reveals the blessings which His shepherding brings to the flock, and we have this in verses 9 and 10b. Now, the first of these is salvation, verse 9b. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Now, this little phrase, three words, will be saved, refers to salvation. Salvation implies being saved. In general terms, the word salvation means preservation or deliverance from harm, ruin, or loss. But salvation is also a theological term. It refers to deliverance from sin and its consequences. Salvation is brought about by faith and trust in the suffering and death of Christ on the cross. In the context in which Jesus uses the phrase, and will be saved, He is referring to salvation from the threats and dangers which surround the flock, and also from the lostness brought about by sin. The prophet Isaiah uses the image of sheep to describe our lives. Some very familiar words in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6a, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his or her own way. 
those of you who are Anglicans or former Anglicans, uh, you will be familiar with the Anglican prayer book. And in it, there is a general confession which people make in church every Sunday. The words go like this, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have strayed from Your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 to 6, Jesus tells the parable about one sheep out of a flock of 100 that had gone astray. This sheep was hopelessly lost. The shepherd went out looking for this lost sheep and found it. The parable has a great ending in verse 6b. Rejoice with me, says the shepherd, I have found my lost sheep. This is salvation. Salvation is all about being saved, being rescued, brought into the fold. The reality is that all of us, by nature, are like lost sheep. We are wandering aimlessly around, far away from the sheepfold. We have completely lost our way. That's what's, that's what's wrong with our society today. People out there have lost their way completely. And that may be true for some of us here inside this church. But we don't need to continue on being in this condition. There is salvation available to us. That's the message I wanted to declare this morning. There is salvation available to each one of you. It's available to me. We can be saved. That is the gospel, in essence. The gospel simply tells us that we can be saved. That's amazing. Jesus, the good shepherd, He comes looking for us. This is the really good news. We don't have to go looking for Him. He comes looking for us. And He can find us wherever we are, even in the most obscure place. He can lift us up, and He can bring us into His sheepfold. We need to enter through the gate of His sheepfold. That is absolutely necessary. It stands to reason that we can't possibly be inside the sheepfold if we haven't entered it through the gate called Jesus. So let me underline this point that Jesus makes. He is the gate or the door to this salvation. By implication, there is no other way to experience salvation except through this gate. How do we enter in? Let's get down to practical matters here. The answer is through Jesus. It's as simple as that. Entering in is a definite act of faith in which we take the Lord Jesus at His word. We trust Him, and then we step into His sheepfold. I sometimes think that we complicate the gospel far too much. At one level, it, it is very easy to understand. 
even the most simple person can grasp its truth. Even though at the same time it's impossible for us to plumb the depths of its meaning. Theologians and biblical scholars help us do this through their writings and so on. But for today, I want us to concentrate on the simplicity of the gospel. The way that you enter the sheepfold, the way you become part of the kingdom, is by making a simple decision to put your faith in Christ, who is the gate. It really is that simple. And if you have never yet taken that step, then I invite you to take it today. Just simply say, Lord Jesus, thank you for finding me where I am in my lostness in life. I trust you. I put my whole dependence on you. Please take me into your fold. And Jesus says, well, if you come through me, then you will indeed be in the sheepfold. I pray you will take that step today if you are still outside the sheepfold of Jesus. But then in verse C, Jesus continues, he or she will come in and out and find pasture. This is an image of security and nurture. The sheep are under the shepherd's care and protection. Bruce Millen, one commentator, points out that the security of the sheep is provided by their proximity to the shepherd, not by the walls of the enclosure. That's a lovely thought. F. F. Bruce wrote, when the people of Christ have forgotten this and tried to secure unity or safety by building walls around themselves, the results have not been encouraging. The walls have either been so comprehensive as to enclose a number of wolves along with the sheep with disastrous consequences for the sheep, or they have been so restrictive as to exclude more sheep than they enclose. The sheep grew through nourishment by the food the shepherd provides. I love this phrase, another three words, and find pasture. The shepherd leads the sheep to what someone has described as springing grass, something that's fresh, provides nourishment, and meets the needs of the sheep. The lesson here is that Jesus, as the good shepherd, is trustworthy. He cares for His sheep, even unto death. That's how much Jesus cares for you, to the point where He was prepared to lay down His very life for you. He lovingly brings the sheep into the lush pasture, the embodiment of the good shepherds of Psalm 23 and Ezekiel 34. And then finally we come to verse 10. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus states unequivocally that the real issue here between the true and false shepherds of Israel is that of life and death. And then He points out what the quality of this life is. Let me read to you the words from the authorized version. Two words, and these are very familiar to us who are familiar with that version of the Bible. 
Jesus says, I have come that you might have life and have it. And the two words are, more abundantly. Uh, Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase puts these words this way, I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Four words, life to the full. This is the eternal life of the kingdom with all its rich biblical imagery. It is glimpsed briefly in the Garden of Eden and seen in a vision in the book of Revelation as a city coming down from God, the holy dwelling of God with His people. It is the life for which we were created. This life is more abundant than can be found anywhere else or under any other rule. No life, and I can say this from my own experience, no life could ever be compared to it. A man called Lindsay Glegg was a well-known British evangelist and Bible teacher in the last century. He was very influential, and he wrote a book, a very short and simple book, but it had this title, and it's the title that you have in the order of service for this sermon. The book was entitled, Life with a Capital L. These words sum up the life that Jesus, as the Good Shepherd, offers us. We have salvation, and we have fullness of life. I've heard so many people say over the years, why would you bother becoming a Christian? Why would you live the Christian life? It's so dull and boring and negative. Christians are always against things and so on. But I can say from my experience, this is the greatest life possible. I have watched many Christian people living their lives over the years and compared the way they live, the quality of their lives, with the kind of life people out in society are living, people who have lots of materialism, lots of wealth, and so on. And there's no comparison. I have known missionaries who served overseas and they had very, very little of this world's goods, yet they were the happiest people you could ever meet. They had such a quality of life. They were enjoying this abundance of which there was more and more. So, if you're put off from the Christian life because you think it is a boring, dull life, please forget it. Listen to the words of Jesus. I am come that you might have abundant life, life to the full, life with a capital L. So, as I finish this morning, I want to ask you this simple question. Have you entered through the gate? or door of Jesus? Are you safely inside the sheepfold of His kingdom? It is important to realize that you're either inside or outside the sheepfold. And there's no middle ground. If you were still wandering around like a lost soul, then why not tell the Lord Jesus that you are outside the gate, and that you now want to enter into the eternal sheepfold. You want to claim Jesus as the gate of your life. But not only will you be safe inside, but you will also be able to go out through the door and have access to the verdant life-giving pasture to which Jesus wants to lead you. 
life to the full. I end by quoting some words of a chorus I learned at Sunday school many years ago. And these words put all of this into simple terms. One door, and only one. And yet its sides are two. I'm on the inside. On which side are you? Amen. Lord Jesus, the Good Shepherd, we give our gifts to You today, and we ask that through these gifts, many people will pass through the gate into the sheepfold and be able to live life to the full. And we ask this for Your dear name's sake. Amen. Good shepherd, you are the shepherd of many flocks. Hear our prayers for all the peoples of the world. We pray for all who are hungry and without shelter. We think of the increasing number of homeless people in Canberra who sit outside shop doorways and along the streets of our city. For those who are frightened or bewildered, for those who are in the clutches of unscrupulous and uncaring leaders, lead us in the paths of righteousness that Your people everywhere may be freed from want. Loving God, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, You call us each by name and claim us as Your own. Hear our prayers for Your worldwide church. We pray for all who are shepherds to Your flock. <clears throat> For all who have lost their way or strayed from Your path, for all who have heard Your voice and responded to Your call, guide us in Your ways that following You we may tread the path that leads to abundant life. Loving God, in Your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Good shepherd, each of your flock is precious in your eyes. Hear our prayers for the communities in which we live. We pray for the very old, the very young, and those unable to care for themselves, for the unemployed, for those who are affected by the increase in interest rates and dreading a further rise this coming Tuesday when the Reserve Bank of Australia meets. For those affected by the rising cost of living and for those who cannot provide for their families. For all whom we love, for our families, our friends, and for ourselves. Protect your people from all danger and harm, that they may know your goodness and mercy in their lives. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good Shepherd, you seek especially your lost and wounded ones. Hear our prayers for all who are in trouble or need. We pray for those who are anxious, those with no clear direction in life, for the lonely, and those who grieve for loved ones, for the sick and dying, and for all who care for them, for those who are going through difficult times, for those who are in hospital and who have come through surgery. We pray in particular for our former minister, Joy Bartholomew, who has had knee surgery yesterday. Grant her a speedy and full recovery. Comfort each of us on each dark and stony path that in your presence we may not be afraid. Loving God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good shepherd, you long to bring all your flock safely home. Hear our prayers for your followers of every age. We give thanks for all who have heard your call and followed where you have led. And we remember those from this congregation whom you have gathered into your eternal sheepfold. Be present with us through all our days and at our life's end, bring us safely through the valley of the shadow of death, that we may come to dwell in your house forever. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We ask our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd of the sheep, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Go forth and share the love of the Good Shepherd wherever you go. May the grace of Christ Jesus, the Good Shepherd, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless all your going out and all your coming in from this day forth and even forevermore.